Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 1. We've spent the past several videos looking deeply at microscopic behavior of gases and fluids, and we've learned about the velocities and energies of molecules, and some of their behaviors like diffusion and viscosity. Today, we'll start to take it step back and find out how the energy of a large sample of gas can affect its chemical behavior. We're especially interested in the connection between the motion of a sample's molecules and its heat. That's a field of study called thermodynamics, and it's what we'll be talking about for most of the rest of this course. Actually, the word thermodynamics tells you exactly what we'll be discussing. The prefix thermo comes from a Greek word meaning heat, and dynamics comes from a Greek word for motion. So, thermodynamics explores the connection between heat and motion. Actually, we'll be looking at two different forms of motion in this part of the course. First is heat. Heat is characterized by the motion of molecules in a substance in random directions. A good definition of heat is that it's a transfer of energy resulting from a difference in temperature between a system and its surroundings, and this energy transfer is accomplished by molecules that move in random directions. The other type of motion is non-random directed motion, which is a characteristic of work. Work is defined as a transfer of energy resulting from forces between a system and its surroundings. Notice that both of these definitions refer to the system and the surroundings, so we need to define those two things very carefully too. The system is defined as the items we want to study. For example, the reactants of a chemical reaction. Meanwhile, the surroundings technically include everything else in the universe. Of course, we can't keep track of every object in the universe, so in practice, we just pay attention to specific things. These might include the solvent in which the reaction takes place, the glassware and equipment in which the reaction occurs, and the air in the lab. So, heat and work both describe the transfer of energy between the system and the surroundings, but the reason for the energy transfer is different for heat and work. One other detail to remember is that heat is represented by the symbol Q, and by definition, Q is positive when heat flows into the system from the surroundings. Meanwhile, work is given by the symbol W, and W is positive when work is done on the system by the surroundings. For now, we're mainly interested in gases, so let's see how heat and work are related to the behavior of a gas. Suppose we have a container filled with a gas. We'll call the pressure inside the container P gas. Meanwhile, the surroundings exert a pressure on the outside of the container, which we'll call P external. Now, imagine what will happen if the pressure outside the container is greater than inside the container, so P external is greater than P gas. As you might expect, the greater pressure outside will cause the container to contract, so the volume decreases. It turns out that work can be expressed as negative P external times the change in volume. There are a couple of things to notice about that equation. First is the negative sign. Why is that there? Well, remember, we said that W is positive when work is being done on the system. But we just saw that when work is done on the system, the system shrinks, so delta V is a negative number. Since we want W to be positive in that case, we need a negative sign on the right side of the equation. Also, notice the units in this equation. As we mentioned in earlier videos, we want to use SI units, which means that the pressure should be in pascals and the volume should be in cubic meters. You might recall that pascals are also equal to kilograms over meters times seconds squared. When we multiply that by meters cubed, we get kilograms times meters squared over seconds squared. And that is the same thing as joules. So, if we use pascals for the pressure and meters cubed for the volume, we get an answer for the work in units of joules. That makes sense, because work is a form of energy. As we saw a moment ago, when P external is greater than P gas, the system's volume is compressed. 
As you'd probably guess, when p external is less than p gas, the volume of the system expands. And the volume doesn't change when the two pressures are equal. What about the case where p external is only infinitesimally different than p gas? In that case, the volume changes only infinitely slowly, and even a very tiny change in p external can cause the direction of the volume change to reverse itself, so that an expansion suddenly turns into a compression, or vice versa. For that reason, a process where the internal and external pressures are only infinitesimally different is called a reversible process. The other situation, where the difference in pressures is finite, is called an irreversible process. It turns out that this equation, which we saw earlier, is valid for irreversible processes. However, for reversible processes, the volume change is infinitely small, but not zero. In that case, we must use this equation. We've replaced delta v with the infinitesimally small dv, and we're now taking an integral with limits of the beginning and ending volumes. But wait, I just mentioned that a tiny change in the external pressure can change the direction of the volume change. That implies that in this case, the external pressure may not be constant. If p external isn't a constant anymore, we'll need to find an expression for it that we can put into this integral. And we can do that. Let's see how. First of all, I'll put the subscript REV on the work to remind us that we're calculating work for a reversible process. The results that we're about to get wouldn't be true for an irreversible process. For an irreversible process, we would continue to use this equation, which we got before. For the reversible work, let's first remember that the external and internal pressures are only infinitesimally different, which means that they're essentially equal. For that reason, we can replace P external with P gas. If the gas is behaving like an ideal gas, we can now use the ideal gas law. Remember, the ideal gas law says that PV equals nRT, so we can replace P gas with nRT over V. N, R, and T are all constants here, so we can pop them out of the integral. That means that our integral is now just the integral of 1 over V dV. If you check a table of integrals, you'll see that this is just equal to the natural logarithm of V. So, the solution to this integral is the natural log of v2 minus the natural log of v1. As you might remember, this is equal to the natural log of v2 over v1. That tells us that the work of a reversible process is equal to negative nRT times the natural log of v2 over v1. So, now we have two useful equations for work one for a reversible process, and one for an irreversible process. Let's use these. Suppose an ideal gas expands irreversibly from 12.0 liters to 18.0 liters against a constant external pressure of 2.20 atmospheres. What's the work performed in this process? We'll use this equation. It's pretty simple. The only thing we need to do is convert the unit so that we get the work in joules. First, remember that an atmosphere is equal to 101,325 pascals. So we'll convert p external to pascals. Next, remember that there are 1,000 liters in a cubic meter, which gives us 6.00 times 10 to the minus 3 cubic meters for our volume. When we solve the equation, we get negative 1337.5 joules for the work. Now let's try that calculation again, but instead of a constant external pressure, suppose this is a reversible process that occurs against an external pressure that changes from 2.25 atmospheres at the initial volume of 12.0 liters to 1.50 atmospheres at the final volume of 18.0 liters. In this case, we'll use the other equation we have for work, this one. But there's a slight problem. We don't seem to know what n or t are. 
How can we solve this equation without those? The secret is to remember that this is an ideal guess, so we can use the ideal guess law to help us. As you might remember, nRT is equal to PV, so we'll replace that part of the equation by PV. We can choose either the initial pressure and volume or the final pressure and volume. Either choice will give us the same result in our calculation. The reason this works is because of Boyle's Law, which tells us that, for an ideal gas, P1V1 equals P2V2, so it doesn't matter if we choose the initial pressure and volume or the final pressure and volume. I'll use the initial pressure and volume, which are 2.25 atmospheres and 12.0 liters. Once again, we need to convert these into units of pascals and meters cubed. When we do, we can solve the equation, which gives us a result of negative 1,109.3 joules for the work. So, we got a result of negative 1337.5 joules for the irreversible process, and negative 1109.3 joules for the reversible one. That's actually a very interesting result. Think about what we just saw. In both cases, we have a system that started out at 12.0 liters and ended at 18.0 liters. But the work performed in these two cases was very different. The only difference between the two examples was the way they got from the initial state to the final state. A property that depends on the way we get from the initial state to the final state is called a path-dependent variable. So, work is a path-dependent variable. Another way of saying this is that work is a path function. As we'll see in the next few videos, heat is also a path function, because heat also depends on the path the system follows as it goes from the initial state to the final state. On the other hand, there are lots of properties that don't depend on the path that was used to get from the initial state to the final state and those properties are called state functions. For example, the energy of a system is a state function. The energy only depends on the state of a system. It doesn't matter how the system got into that state. Well, that's enough new material for now. In the next video, we'll start talking about one of the most useful and fun applications of chemical thermodynamics, calorimetry. I hope you'll join me for that. But until then, have a good week.